Morning everyone and welcome to this Leaders Debate session. Hope you're all having a good day and an interesting morning so far. So I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Maureen Baker and I am the Chair of the Professional Record Standards Body. And if you want to know more about the PRSB, then please join my keynote session later this morning and you'll find out all about us. As well as my PRSB role, I'm also the Chief Medical Officer for um, a self-care app, which is Healthily. And during the pandemic, I've been a GP for NHS 111 COVID Clinical Assessment Service. Um, you might also be interested to know that previously um, I've been the chair of the Royal College of GPs and also I have been a director of clinical safety for NHS Connecting for Health, which was a predecessor organisation to NHS Digital. And in that role, um, I established the safety management system for NHS IT, including the safety standards, uh, the formation of clinical safety officers, etc. Okay then, so it's my pleasure today um, to introduce two colleagues uh, and um, we will be uh, very happy to um, uh, have a good discussion and indeed to, to pick up on any questions that you might have. So to start with, I'm going to introduce Graham Mitchell. Now, Graham is the Head of Provider Assurance for NHS Business Services Authority. Graham, would you like to tell the delegates a bit about yourself, please? Yep, certainly. Thank you, Maureen. And hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Graham Mitchell. Um, and I worked for the NHS for 36 years now in a variety of different roles. Uh, currently, I'm the head of provider assurance at the NHS Business Services Authority. And, and some of you may be aware of uh, the BSA, but some of you may not. And that's a, uh, we are a special health authority or an ALB of the Department of Health. And we, we carry out a range of critical central services for NHS organisations, uh, primary care providers and uh, uh, the general public as well. Um, my, my role really involves um, supporting primary care uh, commissioners and providers in the delivery of their uh, responsibilities. Uh, and one area I'll be talking about this afternoon, and I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of, of, of some of that now, um, is, is around um, the support and increase of, of electronic prescriptions uh, and particularly electronic repeat dispensing. So although EPS is a, um, a NHS digital service through our relationships with primary care colleagues and organisations, we, we've worked with them to drive up the use of um, EPS. Um, and that involves providing support to GP practices direct, uh, uh, helping them with that di digital service and adapting their processes, uh, moving away from uh, pieces of paper to, to effective use of that electronic uh, solution. And I'll be talking this afternoon about how we process uh, uh, 1 billion prescriptions a year. And, and we're now at a point where 90% uh, of those prescriptions are um, electronic, which is, which is really good news. Um, and, and that's generated a, a, a lot of benefit. And, and again, it's, uh, uh, we've reduced our operating costs within the BSA by 10 million pounds over the last three years, which, which, is, a, which is really good and also generated um, efficiencies of more than 85 million across the, uh, across the system. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about what we've done in the, in the pandemic. And uh, apologies if you can hear some background noise there, but we've got some uh, building work going on. Uh, as the pandemic started in collaboration with NHS England and the uh, HSN networks, We've, we um, initiated a GP practice support program uh, to help with the increase of electronic repeat dispensing, which is a component of EPS. And all of the materials around that are on our, our website under um, ERD. But the, the, the key thing from a pandemic point of view is that ERD reduces the admin burden on practices, but also reduces the risk of uh, 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 um, spreading COVID, et cetera, around unnecessary trips to GP practices, et cetera. And as part of that work, I'll be talking this afternoon about how we've increased ERD by 22 million since the pandemic started. And, and something hopefully that Maureen will be interested in is that we've reduced GP practice time on doing that activity by about 96,000 hours. And I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon as well. 
And one of the key things I really want to talk about today and, and keen to get questions on is around how we've uh, uh, used the data as an output from that digital uh, uh, system uh, to, to improve services to patients. One of the challenges that GP practices have is around uh, uh, is identifying patients for ERD. Uh, and one of the things that we've been able to do is securely share uh, lists of patients from the prescribing data that we have to identify those patients. But through the standardization of EPS, and, 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 and I think we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, standards, implementing the NHS number onto all prescriptions is really generated huge rich data sets for us and created huge opportunities around using those data for better better purposes so ccgs and gps use use that data for for all sorts of things um i've, I've mentioned the erd but i do i don't want to it'd be good to talk a little bit about polypharmacy and how we've used that, those data sets to identify patients that that could be at risk of harm and we'll talk a little bit more about that so really keen to hear people's questions around uh, the efficiencies that we've generated through that digitization and, and the enhanced data that's uh, uh, become available to, to make those decisions possible. And the, the key thing for me is, is about how everybody has worked together, embraced the solutions and generated benefit for patients. So keen to, to get questions on, on that too. Uh, hopefully that covers off everything, Maureen, and I'll pass back to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, really interesting overview. Uh, I have to say that I think often people, you know, professionals, never mind patients in the public, aren't quite aware of the scale of what goes on and the I mean, processing one billion prescriptions a year. I mean, that is just phenomenal. Yeah. And I'm not right. aware of electronic prescribing at that scale anywhere else in the world, actually. So, yeah. yes, yeah. It's, it's quite something. So thank you, Graham. And so we'll, I'll now introduce you to Leo Martin-Scott. Now, Leo is the lead pharmacist for electronic prescribing and medicines administration at Taunton and Somerset NHS Trust and I think wins the medal for the longest job title uh, that uh, you can get probably, but maybe not. Uh, so uh, Leo, over to you, please. Thank you, Maureen. Yes, so I'm here primarily, I suppose, to provide a secondary care focus to, to the discussion and conversation. I've been a pharmacist in secondary care for the past 11 years now. Uh, and worked in the digital remit for three years this June. Uh, during this time, I've experienced the deployment of EPMA and, and led the deployment of EPMA across our acute trust uh, to all adult inpatient areas, including our ED department. Um, and I've also had the fortune to be involved in providing the clinical expertise to help drive forward uh, some of the national agenda items, um, stock control integration and dose syntax, uh, as well as bringing the electronic prescription service to secondary care. Currently, my main focus is on looking at deploying our e-prescribing solution to our community and mental health uh, wards in our trust, um, whilst also looking at EPMA and outpatients, paediatrics, maternity, as well as optimising the EPMA system that we already have in place for our adult inpatients and looking at the efficiency gains that we can get uh, from utilising the underlying data. Okay, Leo, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll start with a, a few questions, but um, very much welcome questions coming in from, from delegates. Uh, Graham, I'm really interested in what you were describing as your role in the, in the pandemic. Um, and do you want to say something about your view on how uh, our experience uh, with COVID has driven change um, with with electronic prescribing. Yep, thanks, Maureen. Yes, absolutely. I think the key thing for me is is the um, the realization of the benefits that a digital solution can offer around reducing bureaucracy, 
um, is, is the main thing for me. Um, but if I just use a, um, an example of the electronic repeat dispensing where we were going to set up a pilot at the beginning, uh, uh, actually it was actually on the 23rd of March last year when we were to, to set up the pilot. Um, and uh, on that day we were then asked to um, in, make that um, a, a nationwide uh, um, initiative. Um, and we achieved that in uh, just four days, moving from providing a service to three GP practices to the whole country. Okay. And uh, that, yeah, exactly. And, and but that was only achieved by the collaboration of lots of national organizations, local, local organizations, and teams within those organizations as well. So for me, the COVID has seen the breaking down of barriers and uh, where people have um, seen that collaboration much more to achieve shared goals. And that's something that we necessarily haven't seen prior to COVID. So for me, there was a big, big change around acknowledging the, the benefits of that digital solution, but also people working together to, to, to achieve uh, that rollout, but also for people to use it in, a, in an effect, effective ways for the benefit of patients. And that's the thing, key, key for me is that it was all being done for the benefit of patients. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, Leo, if I move on to you, um, in my PRSB capacity, I'm clearly really interested in interoperability. And um, I wanted to ask you from your perspective in your trust, what you see as the greatest challenges around interoperability and also what you're hoping for as the sort of um, uh, benefits that will be most quickly delivered. So, so a, a two part question, if you don't mind, challenges and hopefully rapid benefits. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so I'll address the first part of that question. Primarily, the, the biggest challenges that we've had with interoperability are dealing with system vendors um, because the, the data standards haven't always been uh, aligned or, or mandated across system vendors. It's often getting them to, to work together and change how their underlying data is, is stored or, or presented. Um, thankfully, with the development of the, the dose syntax work at, an, at a national level and with uh, the fire resources that are available. Um, actually, it's a lot easier for vendors to, to meet those data standards, um, but we still have to get them to actually talk together and put the work in. Um, uh, and then it's really getting users and, and that buy-in from the trust that this is the way forwards. Um, people are quite embedded in their ways. It was difficult enough to get them to adopt electronic prescribing, let alone say, well, actually, we're going to say e-prescribing now is going to link directly to your electronic discharge system. So you don't have to, to key in that information, but people still want to have that sort of autonomy to do it themselves. Um, but the main benefits that I can see that are the quick wins from interoperability are often the efficiency gains. So uh, the areas that we're trying to primarily focus on with interoperability at a trust level are integrating our e-prescribing system with our pharmacy stock control system to enable electronic ordering. Uh, this will improve the time on the ward that's wasted, either taking a drug chart down to the pharmacy department or, or photocopying the drug chart and waiting for the pharmacy to come and collect the work. Uh, it reduces transcription errors in terms of uh, orders being transcribed from a drug chart onto an order pad. And it also improves the efficiency in the pharmacy department because all the work is there waiting for them electronically rather than having to wait for a porter or a nurse to come down or collect the, the work from the ward. Uh, we're also looking at uh, integrating with our electronic discharge system so that the medication summary that's produced in our e-prescribing system links directly into our electronic discharge summary and actually does that reconciliation step at discharge for you. So the drug history that's recorded in the EPM, EPMA system um, is 
reconciled against the discharge prescription produced in the EPMA system and will automatically look for those changes at the point of discharge. So if there was a change of a medication on admission, it would appear as changed with the change reason uh, populated and that goes directly into your discharge summary. Uh, this again is a, a time saving for the poor junior doctor that's having to produce however many discharge summaries a day and it also provides additional clarity and information for the GPs that are receiving those discharge summaries. The main challenge with this though is getting users to use the system properly because if you don't put that drug history in correctly or if you choose not to record it in the prescribing system because you've recorded on a bit of paper as well you then don't have that uh, clarity of information and in actual fact it can provide some risks uh, for example if the drug history is not recorded in the system but you produce your drug hist uh, your discharge prescription in the system every prescription that goes through to discharge summary appears as new when in actuality they may be continued or changed um, purely because you don't have that comparison. So there's there's still a need for uh, a sort of human filter layer to just validate some of that information. Uh, thanks, Leo. Uh, certainly from my perspective as a, as a GP and um, from my patient safety perspective, uh, I'm very aware of the opportunity for errors at interfaces so it's you know mind the gap uh between the the acute sector and, and general practice um and it certainly seems as if there's a huge opportunity to achieve patient safety benefits at really at scale um before i come on to graham a, a, an observation i'll make because uh, i was uh previously in the discussion i was uh, saying that as a gp i did my first electronic prescription 30 years ago, uh, if not longer, actually. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing is, though, that uh, the introduction of electronic prescribing to general practice, so up to the point where we're generating, uh, you know, a billion or uh, approaching a billion prescriptions a year electronically, no study was ever done to look at benefits in terms of um, efficiencies and certainly patient safety. And so, um, and it's, it's actually, um, it's something I've always been quite frustrated about because people would say, well, where's the evidence? And you sort of think, well, I can tell you how it helps patient safety, but I can't point to the specific study. So I just wondered, um, it, you know, is your work being formally evaluated or are you part of any studies? So we're formally evaluating it within our own trust. So one of the key things that we had to make sure we did is, is our baselining work. So we directly did uh, time and motion studies um, and, and looked at uh, prescribing patterns within the trust uh, prior to deploying our e-prescribing system just to prove that we can, what benefits or disbenefits um, the prescribing system has brought in. Uh, we also looked at incidents that were medicines related that had occurred on paper and identified those that we believed a fully integrated EPMA system would look to prevent. Uh, and we have set up governance structures within the trust that review incidents and, and look at um, whether there's been an increase or a decrease in incidents uh, since e-prescribing has come in. But I agree, it's often the last thing that people think about. They, they think it's an obvious um, quick win in, in clarity, but in reality, we're reducing some incidents and creating newer ones as well. Uh, and actually what we're hoping for is that the new ones that we introduce are fewer than the ones that we've uh, had previously. Um, and, and we've noticed this um, in conversations I've had with other trusts around um, discharge medicine service and systems like farm outcomes where actually those key benefits that the discharge medicine service provides in terms of interventions that are made in community by the community pharmacists um, prior to the GP seeing that discharge summary, they're, they're very rarely captured or fed back to secondary care. So when it comes to the service being reviewed and 
determined whether it should be continued or not, it's very difficult to say, yes, this service is providing a benefit to patients. And, and actually, it's only when harm or errors happen that um, you say this service needs to be present. I'm sure we're all aware of um, the case uh, reported, I believe it was last year or the year before, whereby a patient was uh, discharged um, on a parental anticoagulant, uh, where their oral anticoagulant was stopped in hospital, uh, but their, the prescription wasn't updated uh, in a timely fashion at the interface, and the patient carried on taking their oral anticoagulant that was dispensed by the community pharmacy whilst taking their parental one, and a subsequent readmission happens uh, with patient harm resulting. It's only when you put that in the context that you realise that this service is required, but unless you capture those interventions where harm was prevented, then you can't really prove the benefit of the service. Indeed, it's a sort of fundamental tenet of patient safety that when you introduce an intervention, uh, which you hope will give you patient safety benefits, that you really should do a structured risk assessment around that intervention so that you are aware as you can be of risks that you may introduce uh, so that you can then manage them effectively and result in, in you know, a, a patient safety benefit rather than, uh, rather than a loss. The last thing you want to do is do an intervention which makes things less safe for patients. I mean, that, that, that would be disastrous. Uh, I'm going to come to Graham and then uh, I'll come back to you, Leo, with a question from a delegate. But Graham, uh, Leo's talked a lot about uh, efficiency benefits. Um, and I, I think that's something that you're very well aware of in Business Services Authority. Do you want to say a little bit about the efficiency benefits that you've been able to achieve through the electronic prescribing service? Yep, certainly. I think the, I suppose the most obvious efficiency one that we do have is from our internal operating uh, uh, procedures. So this afternoon I'll be taught, I'll be showing an image of um, the paper prescriptions that we used to receive uh, from 11,500 community pharmacies every month. So you can imagine receiving 11,500 bundles of pieces of paper that then had to be managed through uh, to reimburse the, the pharmacies for the, the medicines that they've dispensed. But having the, all of those messages come in electronically in a standardised way means that we uh, have less data entry to do, which means uh, we can uh, introduce extra system validation, which means uh, less human intervention, which means less errors, etc. Um, so over the last five years or so, and I think I mentioned earlier that we've generated over £10 million in operating savings, but in, I suppose in real terms it will be even higher than that because that's just a £10 million difference from 2016 to, to, to now. Um, so, it's, so yes, from an operational point of view, yes, huge benefits. Um, what we also have seen is, and, and it's, it's funny that uh, Leo mentioned time and motion studies, uh, we, we've done some of those in the early days of looking at EPS and, and, and ERD as well in GP practices. So as well as efficiencies that we've had from an operational perspective, we've identified um, operational savings within uh, GP practices as well from using that digital solution. And while um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it, it, we, we, we determined that it was about 15 seconds saving per prescription that moved to ERD. Now, 15 seconds might not seem a lot, but if you then multiply that by the, the volume of prescriptions that, that we all deal with, um, in, in the work that we've done just since March, um, 96,000 um, hours of GP time we've estimated to a save that can then be reinvested in patient care, which it's, it's obviously a huge, huge benefit. So for me, there, there's our internal operating uh, efficiencies that we've, we've, we've seen, but we've also seen um, uh, better use of specialist time in, in, in the community, if you like, to provide better care to patients. So that, for me, that's the, the, the real important one. 
I, I think it's it's tremendously important. And as you say, when you apply 15 seconds to you know all these transactions, it certainly uh, it does uh, it certainly does give you something very uh, uh, desirable. Um, so still on the topic of efficiency services, uh, Leo, um, efficiency savings rather, we have a question from Jonathan Prosser. Uh, Jonathan says he is a CCIO trying to get organisational awareness of the efficiency savings which can be made in his community and mental health trust as well as regionally. There is considerable upfront investment required to set things up in the first place to reap the benefit. So Jonathan is asking, how did you make the case or who did make the case and where was the money found? So I didn't personally make the case that the case was made uh, by our trusts, um, CCIO and associate CCIOs um, for our community and mental health uh, deployment funding. Actually, we we put together a bid uh, for EPMA funding with NHSI um, as and, and we presented it as part of a larger uh, integrated care system vision. So uh, because we had our EPMA funding in our acute trust um, provided via the Global Digital Exemplar program, um, we needed additional funding to further deploy this into community and mental health. Uh, so, like I say, we presented it as part of an integrated care system vision of providing joined up care at the point of transfer between our acute trust and our primary care uh, counterparts uh, in community and mental health. Um, in terms of sort of providing those efficiency savings and, and getting the organisation aware of them. Um, all I can say is time and motion studies are, are probably the best way of, of doing this. And we took a lot of estimates as well uh, and sort of extrapolated that on historical data. So, for example, to, to prove some of the benefits of interoperability, it's um, integrating our discharge summaries to our EPMA system. We took the, the average number of prescription items on a discharge summary and then uh, timed how long it took a prescriber to put that in uh, and then said, right, this is an efficiency saving of X amount of time at the cost of a junior doctor and, and, and therefore uh, the number of discharge prescriptions that we do each year provides an average uh, time saving of this, which is equivalent to the approximate cost saving of this based on the the average salary of a, of a junior doctor. OK, well, I hope that's given some uh, helpful ideas to, to Jonathan and, and other colleagues. Um, I, I would Hope you'll indulge me. I've, I've another thing I'd particularly like to ask you, Leo. Uh, again, from a patient safety perspective. So uh, the question I think is clinical decision support, friend or foe, um, which uh, is a good way to to, to put it. Um, so we're we're looking at um, you know uh, examples of where decision support. Um, does provide realizable benefits and is this anything again in terms of patient safety you you've been able to demonstrate so far so yeah decision support uh i like to describe it as a accrued implement uh and in, in actuality it provides uh some key benefits in terms of safety gains but it hasn't provided the the key benefits that we would have hoped it had uh, would be able to achieve. Um, so it is preventing uh, prescriptions against patients that are allergic to a particular medication, um, and it's providing some support in terms of reducing therapeutic duplication. Um, but because of the lack of configurability within decision support systems actually it's very difficult to highlight some of the risks to prescribers um, so a good example is uh, for therapeutic duplication you can essentially have this on or off now what this means is if you have it on it's there for 
every drug doubling interaction that may exist, whether it's clinically relevant or not. So we've come across, uh, we, we've had examples where you would have, say, a saline infusion running at the same time as an omeprazole infusion that is diluted in saline, and it's saying, this is a therapeutic duplication, you should not be doing this. And therefore, prescribers ignore um, decision support. So okay. we need to... Thanks so much, and thank you both. Sorry we finished it, but thanks a lot. <laughs>